Coming to you from the historic halls of Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, it's time for the Gardening Simplified radio, podcast, and YouTube show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Well, the word nostalgia has its roots in the Greek language and was trans, uh, translated in the 18th century as acute homesickness or homecoming. Now, of course, today, nostalgia is viewed as a natural, common, and even positive emotion. And then, of course, you've got the term vintage, which, uh, boy, it can cover a lot of gardening trends and designs and styles, like architectural gardens of Paris, the romantic winding paths of an Italian villa, Charming, wild, and carefree designs of an English country garden. You can go on and on. There's a vintage style to suit uh, every taste. But, Stacy, we do know that homeowners say that gardening makes them feel nostalgic. Uh, and I guess gardening makes you feel nostalgic. It makes me, it reminds me of a, maybe a simpler time with family. Uh, I remember my dad and my mom, they loved working out in the garden. I love the thought of a hot 4th of July day and sitting underneath a big shade tree. Of course, people have all kinds of nostalgic remembrances of plants like lilacs or a vine that's growing up a wall. Uh, you know, and even in television, you think about the Brady Bunch show and that pathway leading up to the welcoming doors. All of these things uh, create this nostalgic feeling for us, and gardens and plants can do a great job of contributing to a, a nostalgic type of feel. Absolutely, and I think a lot of people do start gardening to bring back some of that magic for themselves, as well as to create some of that magic for the next generation. I think mm -hmm. as we get a little bit older, we start to realize that, you know, these shrubs are not going to plant themselves. And if we want, you know, our children or neighbors or friends or whatever to have these, you know, same kind of experiences that we had, you know, someone had to have planted those things yes. and created a yard uh, a space where you wanted to be because it it did have flowers and it did have plants and that that is what is so you know salient in your memory um and and yeah it doesn't just happen if, if you want that you have to get up and do it and, and and you can be the one yeah exactly a mixed planting can create a real nostalgic feel and and stacy you know a lot of people getting into wildflower gardens rambling wildflower gardens because of the pollinator issue but if you go beyond uh planting it for bees and butterflies uh, a garden like that creates a real cottage garden type of nostalgic feel yeah and you know it, it can I feel like thinking about my own sort of nostalgia for plants that I grew up with, it's interesting to me that some plants that I remember from my childhood do not feel nostalgic mm -hmm. while others do. Mm -hmm. So my mom always had a, I think I just figured this out answering my own question here, uh, had a big old lava rock. Oh, yeah. Near our front porch yep. with hens and chicks planted in oh, the little yeah. uh, the hens and chicks. Yeah, yeah. So this of course was the seventies, early eighties. Um and I I love hens and chicks. I still grow them. I have a, a big collection myself, but I don't think of those as nostalgic. Okay. Like to me, even though I did discover them first as a little child, like I don't have nostalgia for that. But I do have nostalgia for other things my mom grew, like bleeding heart. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely a nostalgic plant for a lot of people. Yeah, for me, it was a neighbor who grew uh, lots of dianthus. Oh, so dianthus. oh, that's cool. That's a very um, definitely kind of more of an old fashioned. I mean, in the Proven Winners line, there are tons of yes. new dianthus, but dianthus are definitely a plant um, that are nostalgic from recent history as well as very old history. I mean, you see dianthus, also known as pinks, uh, you know, in the mm -hmm. unicorn tapestries and all sorts of medieval art. Um, but yeah, there was a time when they were quite, quite popular and then they, they kind of fell off the earth. Yep. And now uh, our partners at Walters Gardens and Proven Winners Perennials are kind of bringing them back. And it brings up a good point, whether it's Proven Winners Perennials or Proven Winners Shrubs. What's been fun for me to watch is 
I've been in the garden center industry since the 70s. And yes, my mom had a strawberry pot with hens and chicks in it. Nice. Okay. And I would have to say I'm really not nostalgic about it either. However, as far as shrubs are concerned or perennials, uh, these plants that give us that nostalgic feeling, roses, hydrangeas, peonies, lilacs, lavender, uh, all of these types of plants uh, give you that feel. But back then in the 70s in the garden center industry, um, we didn't have the plants that we have today. Plant breeding, as we've talked about being in the golden age of plant breeding, I think it's bringing back some of this nostalgia. And uh, Stacy, I planted one of the uh, reminiscent roses in my landscape. And I have to say, it really gave me a nostalgic feeling with a plant that's bred for today and is disease resistant and hardy. I love seeing that. You know, I, 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 and I'm going to talk about this more uh, when we get to the mailbag and I'm sharing a listener story. Uh, it is amazing to me to really get the perspective on what plant breeding has done because people tend to think, oh, it's just about having a new color of exactly. something or, you know, it's a bigger flower. And that's actually not necessarily the case. It really kind of all came home to me that so much of what plant breeding is, is to bring gardening within reach of people now. You know, back in those days, it took a lot of effort for someone to grow those dianthus. Exactly. They needed constant deadheading. They needed so much attention. They didn't bloom very long. So you would put all this effort into something that didn't actually give you all that much of a display, you know, over the course of the season for the amount of work you had to put in. But now plant breeding has dianthus that bloom without you don't need to deadhead them and they're just going to bloom pretty much all summer long. Um, and so what plant breeding has done is not just aesthetic, but is actually uh, taken away a lot of the work that gardening uh, is associated with. Exactly. And it has fed this nostalgia boom. You know, I remember as a kid, mock orange, just a huge unwieldy plant not so today. Bridal wreath spirea, forsythias. Of course, you've got the show off forsythias uh, today. Smooth Annabelle hydrangeas, garden flocks, and creeping flocks. And of course, geraniums, they make me feel uh, nostalgic too, only because in the 70s, that's basically all we sold. At least it sure felt that <laughs> way in the garden center. Spikes, vinca vine, and uh, geraniums. Uh, but balsam, lady slippers, sweet peas, nasturtium, Shasta daisies, hollyhocks, heliotrope, all of these plants uh, really create that feeling of nostalgia. And then when you add to it in the landscape, some antique or worn or weathered planters, uh, cobblestone in pathways, unfinished uh, sculptures and water features that don't have a painted finish on them, but just weather naturally, wrought iron in the landscape mm. is charming and nostalgic and a picket fence even if you don't have the picket fence up to keep your neighbor out or whatever you're using it for the picket fence just really really gives you that uh, nostalgic feeling in the garden now for me one thing that gives me a nostalgic feeling in the garden and i'm going to talk about it in segment four and that is lawn chairs. Ah. Those rotten webbed lawn chairs. Wait, rotten? What's rotten about them? And we would sell them in the gardens. Oh, we had packages of replacement. Wait, have you ever been to a family gathering where someone sat down in one of those webbed lawn chairs and when they get up, uh, they carry the chair with them? Yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah. Or fallen through the chair? They've fallen through. It's happened before. Oh, my word. And we had these tri-folding jelly tube strap lawn oh, chairs. No, those are no good. Those are no good. The old-fashioned webbing ones, cool. The jelly roll one, nah. And there is a certain lawn chair at family gatherings, again, to get nostalgic, that when you pick up your food, your potato salad, your burger, or whatever, at this family gathering, you don't want to be the last one because you're going to be stuck with that chair. <laughs> I'll talk about it in, oh, uh, it in sounds... segment four, but there's something about patio furniture and lawn, and maybe it's because of my history in the garden center industry that it does that but lawn chairs 
give me just this unbelievable nostalgic feeling. Well, you know, my husband and I collect lawn chairs. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and we have an enormous, not enormous, we have a sizable collection. We only take ones that are all aluminum, so never had any wood or plastic. And they have to be the type that have the replaceable webbing, where you can take out the screw yep. and replace the webbing. And, um, yeah, you can pick them up at estate sales for, you know, 2 or $3. And some of them are really quite attractive and very comfortable. So uh, I, I feel you on that. Well, and I'm going to find out in segment four, then, if you have this notorious chair right, that I'm, I'm referring eager. to. I'm so eager to find out. Stay tuned for segment four. First, we'll have plants on trial. We'll see how Stacy ties this all together here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. The order of the day is nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I can't tell you, I, and I, I don't have to tell you, because I'm sure that you, when you were working in the garden centers, um, had people come up to you and say, I'm looking for a plant that my grandmother had. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask you, when people ask you that, how many times out of 10 on average was it a Wajila? It was often a Wygela, but I would truly have to say that at the top of the list was bridal wreath spirea ah. for whatever reason. Well, bridal wreath spirea is very lovely. Mm -hmm. I do like it. Uh, I mean, the flowers last for like, three days right <laughs> <laughs> and they're gigantic <laughs> um but uh yeah i mean that's a plant that i don't i don't i, don't, I think you'd be hard pressed to find them nowadays they kind of have fallen out of fashion you just like see old hedges of them you yes. know out in the neighborhood but i think waigila is one of the most popular you know when people and i think they're more likely to ask about it because they don't know what it is they just can't pronounce it they can't pronounce it for one <laughs> um and for two yeah they don't they just remember that grandma had had this, you know, big bush with trumpet flowers on it. Lilac, they know the name. You know, roses, they know the name. Um, and today's plan on trial is not a Wygela because uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that most plants that are truly nostalgic for people do have fragrance. Yes. Because it it's not just the visual aspect of being around the plant that makes it so nostalgic. And I don't, even if you aren't acutely aware of this fact, um, you know, I think you still have a sense of it that things that you can remember from scent bring back an emotion like nothing else. Yes. You know, you can look at things, you can touch things, all the other senses are pretty good. But when it comes to smell and memory, I mean, it's it's like you can be taken back in time. You know, you can just go back right to a moment. And they say if you have that scent as a young child, mm. it's imprinted on your brain. Yes. And yeah. a lot of for a lot of us that we were going to a grandmother's house or a great grandmother's yeah. house, you know, as young children. So I was thinking about all of this and I came across a very interesting article that I will link in the show notes at gardening simplified on air.com. This is from the Harvard Gazette uh, from Harvard University about smell and memory. Smell and memory seem to be so closely linked because of the brain's anatomy, said Venkatesh Murthy, the Raymond Leo Erickson, life sciences professor and chair of the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology at Harvard. So this is not just us riffing <laughs> on the importance of scent and memory. We have credibility here from an expert. He goes on to say, smells are handled by the olfactory bulb, the structure in the front of the brain that sends information to the other areas of the body's central command for further processing. Odors take a direct route to the limbic system, including the amygdala and the hippocampus, the regions related to emotion and memory. Mm. So it's not just a matter of that smell going right into your brain, but that the parts of your brain that are processing that fragrance or smell are specifically linked to emotion and memory. So it just becomes so powerful. And when, you know, even if we, if someone experiences, plant blindness where they're really unaware of plants and that there are different types of plants and the roles that they fill around us. I think even them, when they have these fragrant memories mm -hmm. of a lilac or whatever it was, um, that they, they have that same, you know, immediate 
emotional and memory type reaction. I think that's why lilacs are such a big deal on Mother's Day. Yes, absolutely. And, and the timing's perfect. So right. You kind of can't perfect. argue with that. Although how much longer the, they will be they perfectly synced. Timing synced's. is everything. We so, don't yeah. know. <laughs> but so it's obvious now why fragrant plants loom so large in our memories, even if there were other plants there. And I think some old fashioned fragrant plants are never going to go out of style. I don't think as long as lilac can be grown in your area, people will ever stop growing lilacs. They just they love them too much but some have almost disappeared from the market some plants that were extremely popular you know a couple decades ago a century ago are almost unheard of literally nowadays and one of those plants is philadelphus also known as mock orange uh, as you might guess from the common name it has small white flowers that do indeed smell quite a bit like an orange blossom but this is a perfectly hardy plant they are um, actually there's species that are native to canada and very cold regions down to zone three most are hardy down to usda zone four and heat tolerant through usda zone eight it's not remotely related to citrus it's actually more closely related to hydrangeas than to citrus which is in a totally different family um, but Philadelphus is a plant that, yeah, I think for so many people, um, the fragrance automatically takes you back. Now, the first time I encountered a truly magnificent memory stirring Philadelphus was when I lived in New York City and we were walking down uh, a street in the East Village and there was an old, 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 old cemetery. The cemetery was closed to the public, but it was still surrounded by walls and still had, you know, plants and stuff from back in the day. And there was a Philadelphus there that was probably about 15 feet tall. And it had these like elegant arching branches that arched over the wall. And the thing was in full bloom. And you just turn down this street and, you know, it blooms in June. So the air is like warm and steamy and just that fragrance on the June air. I mean, it was just, it was mind blowing. Um, but for all of those reasons, the fact that I just described a shrub that was at least 15 feet tall <laughs> and wide um, is one reason why it may have fallen out of favor. People don't have that kind of space. And a couple of other things, because it does bloom in June, if the weather's very hot, uh, not unlike the bridal wreath spirea, especially older varieties, those blooms would just blast through. It just, you wouldn't be able to enjoy them for very long if it's hot and dry. And then finally, and this is a weird characteristic, older varieties of mock orange have very poor quality foliage. So what would happen is that by, you know, summer, the foliage would turn kind of like a, a grayish, sickly green color, and it would get really tattered. So, you know, by the time you're in like mid to late summer, you've got a pretty crummy looking plant on your hands and it bloomed for, you know, maybe a week if you were lucky. And that's a lot to ask for a relatively small Award, reward. So I think a lot of people stopped growing Philadelphus. Um, but Tim Wood, our director of new plant development, loves Philadelphus. And when he set out to develop the first uh, Philadelphus for the Proven Winners Color Choice line, which is today's plant on trial, Illuminati Tower Mock Orange Philadelphus, um, he wanted to resolve all of those issues and create a mock orange that actually merits its spot in the garden. So the first thing that makes Illuminati Tower different is that it lives up to its name by growing as a tower-like shape. So it's very, very narrow, it's very upright, and it doesn't branch a lot. So, you know, whereas most of the time you think about a shrub and it's branching all over and that gives it a lot of width, this does not branch much, so it stays very columnar and narrow. And so compared to the old 15 to 20 foot Philadelphus that used to be grown, this is going to reach five to six feet tall and just three feet wide. So very small footprint, um, but still has a lot of flower power. And that tower habit becomes even more dramatic when it flowers because the flowers are at the top and they just really accentuate this almost four-sided mm -hmm. look that the plant has. It also has very thick, very dark green, deeply ribbed foliage, and this will hold up all season long. So you don't get that tattered, sad look later in the season. Now, as for the flower longevity, that is going to depend on the conditions. It will certainly last longer because these other qualities uh, have to be brought about by uh, having additional chromosomes in the plant to cause them to, to you know, be beefier and stockier and have better quality foliage. That does typically uh, have a positive impact on the flowers where they have more substance and can be longer lasting. But it has that same 
beautiful, sweet fragrance. Um, and so if you're in the market to either redeem some of your own nostalgia or, per, or perhaps plant some nostalgia for the next generation, I think the Illuminati mock oranges are a great choice. Again, we're focusing on Illuminati Tower. I really love this variety because it's a great space saver. And a lot of us just don't have room to just have, you know, things like they used to be. A couple of years ago, you gave me one. Oh, yeah? I planted it. Wow unbelievable and it's in a tight spot fits perfectly in there uh and then this spring when it came into flower i posted pictures in social media people went nuts over it asking what is that plant and my response to them was you're just seeing the pictures if you could smell yeah. this thing if this was smell a vision you'd be even more blown away. I love that plant, Stacey. It, and I'm so glad you said that because it is a plant that you definitely, again, because it's fallen out of favor and there's right. no longer this, of course you're going to have a mock orange because everybody has a mock orange. And um, it's a great way to extend the season beyond the lilacs because they're not going to overlap typically. Your lilacs will be done blooming and the mock orange can come in and take that over. It's deer resistant. You probably have yours planted mm -hmm. in the compound, mm -hmm. um, but it is a good deer resistant plant. Um, very attractive, uh, full to part sun is fine. Although the closer you get to USDA zone eight, the, the end, the hot end of its tolerance, the more shade that it is going to want. It is drought tolerant though. Of course, when it's in bloom, you're going to want to give it a little extra water just to make sure those fabulous flowers last as long mm -hmm. as possible. So planting time is almost done for most of us, but definitely put Illuminati tower mock orange or any of the Illuminati mock oranges on your planting list for next spring and you will be very very glad that you did as will the people who you are trying to create nostalgia for next we're going to take a little break and when we come back we're opening up the garden mailbag so please stay tuned Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. You know, we're going to answer your garden questions, whether they are about something that used to be or something that is or something that will be. <laughs> uh, we're always happy to help. So you can reach us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. There's a contact form there. You can attach photos. And we're always happy to help with whatever is on your mind. And uh, part of the reason that we were inspired to do this particular topic for the show was a message from a listener. And um, so his name is Randall or Randy Cooper. And uh, here is what Randy wrote. Attached are two photos of my father's flower garden from many years ago. This was in the front yard of our house in Park Wind Village in Kalamazoo, a neighborhood designed by Frank Lloyd Wright and added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2022. The neighborhood is now 70 years old, 77 years old. Having grown up there, I'm adding to the history of the neighborhood by making some remarks about the garden view that caused cars to slow down as they passed by on the road. My knowledge of flower names is only modest. What flower species do you see in the pictures? If you could take the time to respond by email and describe what you see flower-wise, I'd really appreciate it. I know some of what's there, but I'd like some confirmation as well. Thank you, Randy Cooper. So when I opened the two photos that Randy sent, and they were dated. So one was dated like around 1955, and one was dated around 1965. And... I mean, if this is one of those situations where if you know, you know, and I know yeah. you know, oh, yeah. um, if you ever had grandparents who you looked at their slides, these photos of Randy's just have this vibe um, that just takes you back to what it was like to yep. be there. Yep. Um, and so I loved seeing the photos and um, I wrote Randy back an extensive, um, Randy, if you didn't get my message, please do reply because I, I wrote you every everything more than you would want to know about the plants um, in your dad's garden. Um, and so the pictures are going to be on YouTube, of course, as well as in the show notes at gardening simplified on air.com. Um, but one of the things, probably the number one thing that really stood out to me in looking at Randy's photos um, and they are beautiful. They're, there's so many different plants in them was how hard his dad had to work Absolutely. to get the, to get the garden to look like that. 
And now, it looks beautiful. Oh, it's stunning. I mean, there's yeah. two different photos. I don't know if it's of the same garden at two different times or mm -hmm. two very different gardens. One is more of a perennial garden full of delphinium. Right. And I think I saw some red valerian in there. I had a whole list. And the other one is more of a sort of traditional annual border, which no one does anymore, right? It looks like something they'd put on the cover of one of those old seed catalogs. Yes. I just loved it, Randy. It, it seriously does. Um, but, you know, Back then in the 50s and 60s, again, as we were talking about, plant breeding was not what it is now. And so um, gardeners like uh, Randy's dad, Fred, they really had to put the time in. And this is where gardening, you know, I think acquired its reputation as just being a ton of work. Because for those gardens to look like they do in these photos, you know, back then there weren't delphiniums that stood up on their own. Exactly. You had to stake them all. Um, you know, you couldn't there, you could get plants mail order. You could buy some things locally in small garden centers, but for the most part, if you wanted any kind of variety at all in your garden, you were growing everything from seed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like nowadays where you can just pop down and bring a couple flats back and start planting and get some immediate gratification. Yeah. The plants are in these plastic trays. Now I remember those days way back when, and they had these plants that they started from seed and wooden flats and people would walk around with aprons and butcher wax paper and you'd pick out the plant you want oh and they'd gosh. trowel it out of the tray, wrap it in butcher wax, write five cents or whatever the price was on it. And wow. I, I have some pictures of that too. So it's amazing. And I, I love looking at that, that the annual bed in the picture that Randy sent, because it does bring back memories. As a matter of fact, I remember in the 1960s that there was a movement to make marigolds the national flower. And really? you would see marigolds everywhere. I remember the, the petite little dwarf ones. They were called boy, oh boy mix. And then you get the huge African marigolds that would be in the back of the bed, uh, you know, a good three, four, five, six feet tall in some cases. And yes, Stacy, many of these plants had to be staked. They didn't have the gravitas that that plants today uh, have, but to see that, or, or there was a state fair mix of zinnias. They'd get really, really large, loaded with powdery mildew. So I would guess in this case, also the gardener was doing a fair amount of hand watering. It's, yeah. it's just beautiful to see. Yeah. The more you think about, you know, the conveniences and everything that we take for granted now, not just in terms of maintaining a garden, but, you know, in terms also of of the plants themselves, the choices that he made. It's so clear that Randy's dad, Fred, had such pride in this garden. I can't even imagine the countless hours he must have spent. And I truly do hope that he that there were many, many cars that stopped um, and talked to him because, I, you know, when a gardener works that hard for something, it means a lot. I will tell you right now, I don't work that hard in my garden. <laughs> if, if it were that much work, I probably wouldn't do it. Um, but, you know, it definitely says labor of love. And so I really thank you, Randy, for sending those in. And thanks for, to your late father for all of his amazing hard work. And, uh, yeah, for really just kind of showing us that uh, gardening nowadays, whether it's annuals or perennials or shrubs, um, watering, fertilizing, buying plants, caring for plants, it is a whole new day and we can all shed those, um, you know, biases and pre preconceived notions we have about gardening being a ton of work and you can't go on vacation and, you know, you can't do anything but work in your garden. It's not like that anymore. Yeah, I just, those pictures gave me such a nostalgic feeling. By the way, in that bed of annuals, also the re a red flower that I see in there, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's a salvia and mm. everybody oh, yeah. planted that thing. And it was a variety by the name of Red Hot Sally. <laughs> And really? everybody planted red hot Sally and you know, the, our annual salvias today, proven winners has the rockin series, the mm -hmm. rockin fuchsia. They are incredible. These are aggressive plants. They bloom beautifully. They're, they're just 
unbelievable performers in the garden. Red Hot Sally, you'd put it out there, and yes, it would put out this flush of beautiful red flowers, but then we'd get some hot, steamy weather, maybe a rain shower, and now it'd be Red Hot stems. It's just a stem fest. So yes, the work and the care that he put into that garden is evident. And I love those photos. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you brought up the Salvia Coccinia or Red Hot Sally, because that is uh, not dissimilar to today's plant on trial, the mock orange, where it was a plant that was everywhere for a go. while and then poof, just disappeared off the face of the earth because people were just like, I'm not dealing with that. <laughs> you know, it was just too much work for too little reward. Well, you got to say it for our listeners. Blammo. Blammo. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, and, and now I feel like it's starting to make a comeback. Proven Winners has some new Salvia Coccinia that are definitely not your grandmother's Salvia Coccinia. Um, there's a lot of different types of Salvia out there, but I'm glad you brought that one up because that is definitely that with the marigolds really oh. put that garden in its time. Fantastic. All right, real quickly here, Stacy, we've got to help Stephanie out. She's in Zone 5B, Yorkville, Illinois, and my nine of my big leaf hydrangeas are starting to put out a second round of blooms. What do I do? We're seeing that. This yes. Year, right? So basically what is happening here, Stephanie, is that you have a variety of reblooming big leaf hydrangea that needs to put on a certain amount of growth before it will create those new wood flowers. So those are the older types. They need more time to do that. And so for a lot of people, especially in the Midwest, our summers just aren't long enough for that rebloom to occur, and we normally never see any of it. Whereas this season, because it has been quite mild and, and much longer, it's giving those older varieties of hydrangea a chance to actually create that so-called rebloom. So all this is is buds that it formed back in August that did not need vernalization or cold treatment to bloom. It doesn't mean it's taking away from next year. It's not a problem for the plant. It's not making it more sensitive to frost. If you do get a frost, those old flowers are just going to you know turn brown and, and go away and you can cut them off if you'd like. But it's really not a cause for concern if you don't want your reblooming hydrangeas to start reblooming in late October, early November. You would actually like that to happen in the summer when it counts. Uh, do take a look at the Let's Dance reblooming hydrangeas, particularly the varieties Let's Dance Skyview and Let's Dance Can Do. Those are our fastest mm -hmm. rebloomers, and so you will actually be able to get rebloom during the summer rather than waiting all the way until fall when you're thinking more about, you know, mums and mistletoe than yeah, hydrangeas. There you go. <laughs> That's fantastic. And a quick 30 seconds here. Nelvia uh, wrote to us because I love this plant. I have it in my landscape. Oh, so easy lemon zest rose. Nelvia has an unusual leaf cluster, uh, but this is something we see out there. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, and Nelvia did include pictures, which will be on YouTube. Um, unfortunately, this is pretty much a characteristic case of rose rosette disease. Yep. And rose rosette disease is a, I, I could talk a lot about it. It's quite a fascinating disease. Um, there are no known resistant roses right now to rose rosette disease because it's not a disease like fungus that just blows in on the wind. It's actually transmitted by an, a little mite, a tiny, tiny little broad mite that blows in on the wind. And then that guy has some bacteria in its digestive tract that it transmits to the plant and once they get this uh, rose rosette disease they cannot recover the best thing that you can do is to take it out and discard it which will prevent it from being uh, preyed upon by additional broad mites and they will then get the bacteria in their stomach so um, it's unfortunate but it is not recommended to keep the plant it won't recover you should take it out and they recommend not planting a rose it's not in the soil but because it's most likely that the mites will come back and feed on your new roses that are replacing it they do not recommend replacing an infected rose rosette disease rose with another rose we're going to take a little break when we come back we got branching news so please stay tuned Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news. And Stacy, today, instead of a limb, a Rick, I need a moment for a lawn chair rant. Oh. We're talking about nostalgia today, and I have lots of nostalgic memories of lawn chairs. Folding aluminum webbed lawn chairs in the 1970s at the Garden Center, we sold them for $12.95 each. And on the 4th of July, they would be on special for $9.95. Dang, that's a bargain. What a deal. 
Now, we didn't have Google or YouTube or tech support to figure out how to open the stupid chair uh, or get out of it for that matter. You couldn't call tech support. And for people who would sit on one of these strapped web lawn chairs and you're wearing shorts, if you sit on that chair too long and then get up and walk away, people will be able to tell that you've been sitting in a web strap lawn chair. Now, these chairs are amazing. Uh, you were risking injury or embarrassment every time you put your seat in one of those chairs. And at that time, I recall as a kid, in addition to the web chairs, we had metal lawn chairs. Now, think July. Think 100 degrees. Yeah. Think sun. Think shorts. You get the picture, <laughs> right? Yeah unbelievable. So my point is when I was a kid back in the 60s, we had real lawn chairs. The lawn chairs today I call yawn chairs. They are equivalent to furniture that you would have in your living room. You could take a nap on them. They have cushions. They are yeah. just so comfortable. We had real lawn chairs back in the 60s and 70s. Today we have yawn chairs. Now, uh, those colorful ribbed chairs, those web chairs, think about it. If you're at a family gathering and you pick up a big plate of potato salad and your hamburger and uh, you go to sit down in the chairs and my parents would have all these webbed lawn chairs sitting around. By the way, everybody had packages of replacement webbing in their garage because they tore all the time, okay? And uh, Uncle Frank was a little large and he would do some damage to the chair you have to re-web the chair uh, but if you got your potato salad and your burger and everyone's seated around having a great nostalgic time sitting around underneath the shade tree in those lawn chairs and you were late in getting your potato salad and hamburger there's one chair left it would always be the dreaded macrame lawn chair wreck Rick, I make these. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> sit in a macrame lawn chair. <laughs> That's why I'm bringing it oh, up. Oh, man. All right. You're not invited. <laughs> a 90 degree day in chat. Now, how do you keep that pattern from like imprinting on your leg? Oh, you don't. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, wear pants, I guess. All right. So I guess they're not yawn chairs. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I get it. I will say that the, <laughs> I, I've always wanted to do one. And I, so I did one with the actual traditional macrame cord. And it's not macrame. People call it macrame because it's a macrame cord. But the actual technique is a combination of crochet and weaving. And um, so I did one and it was fun. I enjoyed it. It was actually pretty expensive. I mean, I, like, yeah, I can imagine the idea they, uh, is that it should be cheaper than the webbing, but yeah. now it's hard to find webbing. So I think they're even more popular. Now I am working currently on a new version of this using paracord. So, you know, paracord, um, you know, it's, and so the paracord instead of the macrame cord is uh, much softer Okay. and, uh, it's not as prickly. So it's not like as plasticky, it's more suitable for the outdoors. Um, so I haven't finished it yet to say for sure if it's going, how it's going to compare. It was similar in price. I mean, the macrame lawn chair is not saving you any dough. No. It's you're spending probably a good 30 to $40 to replace the, the webbing with the macrame cord. And for the paracord, it was probably more like 40 to 50. So it's a labor of love. It's something you do because you enjoy it. And because the chairs that I'm working on right now were actually our good friend's grandmother's chairs. Really? Yep. And they had the jelly strap, which I hate. Um, uh. And so those don't have like the, the, the really good vintage lawn chairs have holes for screws in the back so they can be infinitely replaced. And it's okay. a pretty easy and straightforward process. So yeah. I am pro lawn chair. It's hard to find good replacement kits anymore. I guess too many people had them in the garage and they rotted away or they threw them away or whatever. But, um, you know, when I see a good webbing replacement kit at an estate sale, you better believe I snap that up. Yeah. Back in those days, you would see the twisted frame of one of those chairs every week out by the trash, out by the road, right? 
Exactly. And the patio furniture was yellow and green, large floral print cushions oh, yeah. that match the color of the appliances in your kitchen. And yes, the vinyl jelly tube chaise lounges. These are trifold vinyl tube strap lawn chairs. And uh, th those things were horrific. And what teenagers would do at that time in the 60s and 70s, totally dumb. But in summer, you'd slather yourself in baby oil. Oh, yeah. It's right? To get a good tan. And you'd slide between the straps of these tube strap lawn chairs. <laughs> and I guess this just brings back all kinds of nostalgic memories for me. Well, I can't believe you didn't mention, I feel like this was everywhere when I was a kid, um, that red stained wooden patio furniture. Oh, that, yes. Yeah, you know, that yeah. was that was everywhere. Yes. And if you're wearing baby oil, it's not pretty. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this stuff just comes back to me. It's just unbelievable. So I'll give macrame chairs another try. All right, I'll, I'll bring you one to sit in. You can see what you think. I will say one thing that sit I truly right do anyway. love about our vintage lawn chairs, um, and we only pick them up at a bargain. You know, we're not, like, looking to do anything crazy. But I, I do appreciate, compared to furniture in my garden that I've paid much more for, that it truly can go anywhere. And in a garden, you know, you want to be able to move around and sit wherever is looking good, right. you know, at whatever given time. And the lawn chairs, you know, they're not just called lawn chairs for the sake of it. They're called lawn chairs because they can sit in the lawn and not go into the lawn, not pick up the soil. Uh, the, the weight is distributed. So you can really put them any place that you want. And so, yeah, say some, you know, part of your garden that you don't usually sit near is looking great. You put two lawn chairs out there, you enjoy it while it lasts, and then you can move it to another place. Yeah, because Stacy, they took these aluminum lawn chairs, and then they took it the next step, and they made rockers out of them. Oh, yeah, that's Remember true. those things? Uh, actually, my um, original macrame is also a rocker. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. we got to bring one in the studio, right, and i got to give it a try. We will. Now, uh, growing up in the garden center industry, also, i got to quickly mention, of course, pink flamingos in the ah, lawn. Ah, yes. Plastic pink flamingos. Goes uh, a guy by the name. He was a 21 year old art school graduate. His name was Don Featherstone. Oh, I love that. And uh, he's the one that created uh, this this product. And when they first came out in the U.S., you could buy a pair of flamingo lawn ornaments for two dollars and seventy six cents. I also remember a company called Union Products, and they would do blow-molded plastic stuff. Now, it's real interesting because they carried it over into Christmas, all the mm. blow-molded figures. Yeah, the snowman. And yeah, and their most famous one was Santa behind the reindeer in a sleigh, and it was uh, famously depicted uh, by um, uh, the movie... Uh, National Lampoon's Christmas ah, vacation. Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, when Clark W. Griswold goes nuts out on the front lawn and starts kicking the antlers off the uh, the reindeer. But we would sell a lot of Union products, and their two big items were Dutch kettles and cauldrons. Oh, I was going to mention the cauldron. I'm glad you brought up the cauldron. Yes, and people would plant geraniums in them, mm -hmm. not put drainage holes in them, so they drown the plants. Okay, you could pour the one, but these black cauldrons and Dutch kettles just bring back all kinds of nostalgia for me. And then another big one, and I'll end it with this because I could talk about this topic for days, but the spinning daisies out in oh, the yard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Daisy pinwheels. And they sold these things to you saying that they would solve your problem for underground pests like moles and voles by transmitting vibrations into the ground. Ridiculous. And, uh, and so they had all kinds of different colors of daisy pinwheels. And I remember as a, a young man working in the garden center industry, uh, we wouldn't just get a few boxes of these. We would get semi loads of these things. We'd sell them for 99 cents each, and we would sell thousands of these daisy pinwheels. You don't see those anymore. Now, I have to ask you. They're out there. On the Union Products thing, are they also the, the people behind the swan planter? Yes, same thing. 
the swan <laughs> the good planter. old swan planter <laughs> <laughs> just amazing well i'm feeling nostalgic how about you i am you brought back a lot of memories <laughs> thanks for a fun show stacy and i'm looking forward to sitting in this studio in a macrame chair yes watch out for it on youtube <laughs> <laughs> thank you adriana and thanks to you for your support and watching us on youtube listening to the radio show and our podcast have a great week <laughs>